early days of the internet, radical libertarians were scattered, lonely, and faceless. Without direction, they resigned to scour the web, sifting through content providers in a wasteland plagued by YouTube demonetization, Facebook jail, and covert internet censorship. But then, in 2017, the Libertarian Union was formed. Finally, the average Joe Libertarian could find a thriving community of independent podcasters and content providers all in one convenient location. At Libertarian Union, we'll always have the latest news, interviews, discussions, and even movie reviews. With hundreds of episodes and more added all the time, you'll always find something fresh at libertarianunion.com. All right, all right, all right. Oh, let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Actual Anarchy Podcast, the podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian anarcho-capitalist perspective. And tonight we're going to talk about a Will Smith and Jaden Smith movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, on uh, this 67th episode of the podcast. And show notes and more can be found at actualanarchy.com slash 67. have my co-host Robert with me. And how are you doing, sir? I, I think we should... Um go for some sort of a world record for the longest intro. Every time we add a thing, just just keep tacking on another 15, 20 seconds. I don't know. It seems like we have the longest intro in podcasting. It's good, though. It's well, it, is, it is ostensibly the best part, so we've got that going for us. Yeah, you could just listen to the entire intro and then just turn it off. Yeah, I, don't know, I, I, I think I'm regretting my caramel corn situation, my caramel corn decision to eat some caramel corn before the show. Feeling some effects. Yeah, you getting the the sugar rush, you getting all the itis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, uh, this sugar situation is kind of interesting. I've uh, made a batch of caramel corn, you know, like a couple of days ago, and now I've been eating it, and I've noticed that I've had to like. You know, my my joints are a little inflamed. You have to, like, do the, the cricks and the cracks, and you got to pop them. I think it's, like, increasing the uh, the inflammation in my body. And I don't know anything about it. It's just, it's just weird. So I don't know. I think I'm just going to try and avoid sugar as much as I can. It's a good idea anyway. Well, I hear it's not so good for the teeth. We just did our dentist visits the other day, and uh, no cavities on any of the kids, so that's a good thing. But we also limit the sugar, so probably also a good thing. I mean, historically, you know, history of man, right? And I know it's Women's International Month or whatever. But I mean men as in a type of people, like, or a people, people, anyway. Like a species? Like a species, yes. Like scientifically. Uh, had a very limited intake of sugar throughout history, and then it's only in recent years where scarcity has been reduced to such an, an extent that sugar is now abundant in such a high proportion of uh, the Western diet. So our bodies are not acclimated to this. You're right. You're right. We got basically caveman genetics. And we're trying to eat these uh, modern processed foods that's with, that are loaded with preservatives and sugars and carbohydrates and things like that. So, yeah. It's not yeah. great. I mean, I'm talking out of my, you know, my butt here. but yeah. That's what we always do. Making it up as I go along. But I think I heard this somewhere, and I know that our guest on the um, Boys Night Out, Kyle, he is, is such a uh, type of person to know this. Such such information as this. So perhaps I will reach out to him. 
and have him not only write that Star Wars article he was telling us about, but also give us the rundown, the lowdown on the sugar high. Sounds fun. So I know that our show is about movies. Um, we'll get to we'll get to this in a minute here. Uh, this is oh, yeah. just totally a random conversation, but we did have other random conversation prior to this that is in the pre-show, and that's available for our Patreon supporters. And I've added additional ways to get to our Patreon, so you can get there at patreoncom readrothbard or readrothbardcom Patreon or actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. All three redirect to the same uh, same page where if you wish to support us at various levels, you will get various rewards, including uh, pre-show and post-show content and a couple of other goodies that we're putting in there. And um, we'll try to figure out some other stuff as well, I'm sure. But throw that little plug in there, and we'll be ready to get into what we call the normie-friendly version of the show in just a moment. Uh, the Last Nighters, and this will be episode 10 of that, and that is a shareable version that you can um, post around or, or give to friends and family if you don't want to have the anarchy stank on the on the name of the show, but you still want to expose them to some of the content. And we're trying to be a little bit subversive about getting the message out there and, and trying to brand it and fashion it in such a way to where it's more palatable and more acceptable for people to not immediately turn up their nose at it, I guess, would be the concept, right? We're still doing uh, experimental here. Yeah, buddy. Sneak it in any way you can. Like some medicine and into an old person's, like, applesauce. Yeah, yeah. Or like in Happy Gilmore, just tap it in. Just tap it in. A little tappy tap. A little tapperoo. All yeah. right, well, enough of this nonsense. Why don't we get into the normie-friendly zone? Are you ready? Let's do it, Daniel. All right, here we go. Well, hello, and welcome to the Last Nighters. We are the Last Nighters, Daniel and Robert, and we are going to talk about the movie The Pursuit of Happiness, and this will be episode 10, and the show notes can be found at lastnighters.com slash 10. But how you doing, Robert? We're going to get into the Google description in just a moment. Oh, I'm full and squishy, baby. I'm ready to talk about some movies. All right. Sounds like a good deal. That's what we're here for. We've done uh, 10 of these on the last nighters, and uh, this is a, uh, you know, a tug at the heartstrings one, so we'll see how many tears get jerked on this. But let's get into the Google description. The Pursuit of Happiness came out in 2006, and it uh, got 8 on the IMDb, 67% Rotten Tomatoes, 95% of Google users like it, and here is the description. Life is a struggle for single father Chris Gardner, played by Will Smith. Evicted from their apartment, he and his young son, Jaden Christopher Sire Smith, find themselves alone with no place to go. Even though Chris eventually lands a job as an intern at a prestigious brokerage firm, the position pays no money. The pair must live in shelters and endure many hardships, but Chris refuses to give in to despair as he struggles to create a better life for himself and his son. Uh, came out December 15, 2006. And I think uh, Will Smith got a couple of nods for um, at least nominations for Best Actor and, and things like that. I don't have the box office information here, but I think it did fairly well. It's one of those feel-good Christmas movies that came out at the end of that year. Uh, any uh, any qualms with you on that description, Robert? No, the description is clean, Bob. Um, I remember actually seeing this in theaters, and uh, yeah, liking it at the time. My memory actually does stretch that far back. It's now uh, 12 years old, a little long in the tooth. But yeah, this is a strong performer, although I think my co-host didn't find it quite as engaging as I did. Um, I thought that was just kind of surprising me because I thought as a father, you would maybe identify with 
some of the struggles of raising a child, but I guess due to your white privilege, you don't have to uh, have any such problems. So life is just ice cream and unicorns for you. Am I right? Well, yeah, I mean, diving save at the end there. I mean, there are plenty of unicorns and ice cream on this side of the uh, of the microphone. Um, yeah, you know, this is a movie that just seemed to drag on for me. It's just about two hours, and it felt like four. And it was like this guy just keeps continuing to do dumb stuff and continuing to fail, and he's presented as a very smart guy, and I know in real life he's a super smart guy, but man, was he making a lot of poor decisions. Yeah, did that did that bother you? I mean, did you want a more of a Mary Sue character that didn't really make any mistakes? Because generally, you know, if you have a protagonist, you want them to make a couple of mistakes so that they can learn from them and grow as a person. Well, it was just frustrating to to see it. And I suppose I'm looking at it with a bit of a jaded lens because jaded. I'm looking at it haha, right? I'm I'm throwing the puns out there just like I did with the the cars episode. There were probably like 18 cars puns in uh episode 9. But I'm looking at it, you know, from an uh an observer's view. And from a, uh, I'm trying to be entrepreneurial and I'm, I'm studying Austrian economics and, and trying to get in, gain an understanding on all of these types of things. And then to watch a movie where he's making obvious mistakes, at least obvious to me, um, though I'm sure in the situation it's not as, so obvious, right? I mean, it's well, always so easier to give advice to another because you're, you're seeing a you know window of of the situation, and you can offer the advice on that. But when you're actually in it, and there's so many different like tacit um, angles on it, and and little you know portions, you can get very confused and lost and and muddy within it when you're making your own uh, your own way through problems like this. Okay, so outside of there's one major mistake. I wouldn't even say it's major, but it was you know pretty big to him, and it's a big point of the movie. And he even admits it's stupid. He calls it stupid right when it happens. But yeah, I mean, even at the time when you when you, he originally starts thinking about it, even before the bad thing happens, you're going, "Why would you do that? Why in the world?" Would you trust your livelihood and your property to a hippie? <laughs> but other than that, what, what mistakes are you talking about here? I mean, a lot of it w- for me was a couple of some misfortune, one really dumb mistake given the, 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 the scanner to a hippie. But then, you know, he didn't have anything to do with the IRS coming and jacking his money out of his bank account. I mean, oh, what, he, he what, certainly did. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. He didn't pay tribute to them. He didn't grovel before them and pay them, and so there were consequences to that. Uh, one of the you know early consequences on the way up to uh, the escalation path that they have, if you don't pay. So wait a minute. So you are essentially victim blaming here, sir. You're saying that. Because he didn't pay some thugs some some protection money or whatever, some hush money or just whatever they claim is their cut, it's stupid of him to think that he can keep his own money? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that if you don't pay the protection money, then don't expect the protection. From themselves? From, right. From the people? Yeah, they're saying, so, if, if you pay us, we won't mess with you as much. Right. So you think he's obligated to pay them? No, I'm saying there are consequences to not paying them. I'm not saying it's correct or moral. I'm saying that it's a well-known thing, 
and he didn't even act as, as if he was aware of it. And maybe he wasn't. But I'm just saying it was another thing that he did or, or failed to do that ended up having consequences for him. Well, no, he was aware. In the very beginning of the movie, he says, you know, I'm going to take care of this. i got to file an extension with the IRS. And then his, his wife is upset and worried about it. But then he doesn't. But you're saying that it was a stupid mistake and you didn't like the main character because of all these dumb mistakes? He made lots of mistakes. Not just giving, trusting the hippie with these bone density scanners, but the fact that he bought the bone density scanners to begin with was a, was a poor move. Not not the uh, initial, you know, the, the idea, like you and I, we have a mutual friend and, and he tends to get excited about a project and, and throw everything he has at it. Yeah. And the Chris Gardner character does that in this movie and then they don't sell, right? Or they sell very, very slowly. And he's sunk his life savings into it. His wife is working as like a hotel maid or whatever. Yet they're not able to pay the rent and pay the, uh, you know, the extortion fees from from the taxes and, and, and the parking tickets and all of these things. And uh, I just got a question, you know, why throw all of your eggs in one basket into something? And then if they're not able to sell, why not adjust your price? You know, market's clear, right? Or focus on something else, right? Like cut your losses. I mean, it's not just that he's throwing his money into it, but he's beating the street trying to hawk these things. And he could be doing something else productive to bring money in to pay the rent, pay the extortion fees, pay the other extortion fees. And side note, where was the wife's money going? Because she said she's working like double shifts and, you know, working way too much and yet they're not paying the rent. Well, from what I saw in the movie, she had a bit of a drug problem. They make an allusion to that. I mean, it's never overtly shown, but she had some, some problems in that regard. I mean, at one point, we you know, when she wants to leave, he's like, you, you know, you're not going to take my son. You can't, you can't take care of him. And I think there were some other things that there was an allusion to her having issues with her not being able, you know, being a, some sort of a fit parent or something like that. But I, that, you're right. I mean, that's never really shown in the movie. So where exactly it was all going to other than living expenses, we're, we don't really know. Right. And, and she had cigarettes, at least. And I mean, I'm sure they were much cheaper back in the early 80s, but it's still, you know, it's making choices here, right? Like, what's more important to you, cigarettes or paying your rent. I mean, they've, they've got this uh, five-year-old kid and you would think that having a home for them would, you know, be higher up on their, on their marginal utility scale here. And they're, they're speaking of marginal utility. Uh, the kid, Jaden, I forget his name in the, in the movie, but he, um, he talks about making a list that is of things he would like for his birthday and trying to prioritize which one thing he would want more than anything else. And I thought that's a great lesson in marginal utility. You know, you're giving a, a, a an ordinal scale of what's most important to you. And mm -hmm. you're putting the one thing at the top that you would want and you're foregoing all the others. And if only the parents would have done the same, <laughs> they would have avoided a lot of this heartache and headache. Well... So you're not really sympathetic to these young parents and their trials and tribulations because this really movie isn't so much about like a character arc. This is more of a, uh, just a guy who's really struggling to make it, so to speak, and all the, the things he has to deal with to finally succeed. 
you didn't really find any kind of sympathy for him. Is that what you're saying? No, I was just mostly frustrated by his his uh, lack of making better decisions, better choices. Because he, they show him as a very smart guy. And I guess that's another side of it. You know, like, why is a smart guy doing such dumb stuff? Well, I mean, I could... I think people are very intelligent in different ways. You, he, in the movie, he was presented as a very math smart, kind of a bookish smart guy, but maybe not such a street smart guy. I mean, he's also a very... He's a dreamer. And... You know, while his wife is far more practical, he's like, well, I'm going to get this internship at Dean Witter. And she's like, internship? What does that pay? And he's like, nothing. And she's like, Psh, that's a dumb idea. Why would you ever do that? And he's like, because it's a stepping stone to a, a, a better life and a, a greater path and success and to happiness. And she's just like, Psh, stupid. I'm not going to support you in that. I'm out of here. And, I mean, for the movie, for me, it was about, you know, chasing your dream and don't let anybody get in the way of it. And if you want something in life, go out and get it and work as hard as it takes to get that and to succeed in whatever it is. I mean, the whole movie is about the pursuit of happiness and whatever happiness is for you to go out and take it and work hard for it. And I found a ton of sympathy for the guy in that. Well, that's good. Good for you. I I did see some redemption at the end. You know, he did sh- struggle a lot, and it did pay off for him, but he did put his kid through a lot of unnecessary stuff. Okay, so are you telling me that he was becoming an intern at Dean Witter was a bad move to make? No, not not moving on from the bone density scanners continuing to live in the house where he was paying double the the rent that he would have paid just two blocks away. Even the, the guy, the landlord, was telling him, why do you continue to live here when you're not even paying me rent, but you could uh, probably afford this other place down the block that's like half as much. Right, so but we're never shown that other place. Could have no, we are shown that other place. We're rent. shown it. We're shown it. He moves to it. It's the motel. That's what he was talking about? He talked about the hotel? I think so, yeah. And so the other thing about this guy was he was stealing constantly, like all over the place. He was stealing rent at the house or the apartment. He was stealing motel fees. He was stealing cab rides. Yeah. Do you not have any problem with with any of that? I mean... It seemed to me like he was just going around stiffing people because of his poor decisions. Okay, so what what about these I, I agree that those you know, stealing these things is not great. I, I'm not gonna defend his decisions. You know, even though he you know whatever, had like noble goals or whatever, like he was, you know, supporting his child and trying to get a better life for himself. It doesn't excuse what he did. But what what are these, what what would a better decision have been? A better decision? Yeah, I mean, you're saying these are all bad decisions. What decisions would you rather he have made? Cut your losses on the bone density scanners. Um, Do something actually productive. Don't live beyond your means. Don't don't live in a place that you can't even afford the rent, especially when it's made clear in the movie that there is a place that is an alternative that is half the price. Uh, what else? Um, so what you would you rather he have done? Just just taking the loss on the bone density scanners, just throw them in the garbage or something, right? Or reduce Instead your price. Instead of trying to go or, out and sell them on the on the weekends, right? That was a waste well, of time, according to you. No, no, no. He, that was going to be his job, and he was failing at it, right? And only when he got this internship did he do it weekends only. And right. he had six, six left. And when he first bought them, what did he have, like 40? And he did sell them all. It's just it took him too long, right? So he was eating away the 
proceeds. Yeah, so what would he have, should have done? Throw them in the garbage and then get a job, get some other job? Well, I've already made it clear that he should have moved into the cheaper place and he should have done something actually productive rather than try to sell these things that aren't selling. Right, like what? I don't know. You can always get a job in a non free right, so, market. Right, you so have gone out chuck them in the garbage and then go get a job flipping burgers or something. That's what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, or, or not, even, not even throw them in the garbage, but do, this, do a similar thing to what he did in that go and get a productive job and then try to sell these things on the weekend. Well, that's what he did. No, he got an internship, an unpaid internship, that at the end of six months, he had an opportunity to maybe have a job. Right. So you disagree with his path. You don't think he should have done the internship thing. I think that he should have made better decisions well before the internship thing even came about. He was already in a deep hole. Okay, fine, but does, should he have gone into the internship or not at the time in which he did it? I, I wouldn't have. I mean, it worked out for him, but I, I think it was probably not the um, prudent decision to make at the time. So it was overly risky for you? He was already not able to pay rent. He was already not able to put a roof over his child's head. Correct. They were living in a shelter at that point. After they got kicked out of the hotel. Right. But he had he had accepted the internship prior to that. Yes. Because he had counted on being able to sell off the rest of the scanners to be able to fund his internship. And And what's your point? I'm saying he had a plan. Not a very good one. <laughs> he had a plan that was working. He didn't count on the IRS stealing his money. Right, which was terrible, but it was preventable. Preventable. Yes, it was preventable. How can you prevent the IRS from stealing your money, Daniel? Please tell me. I'm sure everybody wants to know. He could have actually done the extension and paid the amount that they demanded of him. At That's the, time. the same thing. No, there were fees and, and late charges and whatnot. And they, they extracted the money from his accounts directly without his knowledge or consent. Right. Yeah, when so, do they require anybody's consent? No, you're missing the point. He, he could have handled it well ahead of time had he been making better decisions. Had he actually gone out and done something productive, he would have had the money that they demanded earlier, and he would have been able to pay his rent and live in a cheaper place and be able to afford to keep a roof over his kid's head. He had already been evicted from his apartment when he decided that he was going to live in this motel and sell the last six scanners during the internship. He was already digging a very deep hole for himself. He was taking a huge risk. I agree. He was taking a huge risk, a long shot payoff. And it ended up working out for him. But it was a long shot. So you you think he's just a, like a bad parent? Yes, he's a terrible parent. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I did not see. I saw a guy who struggled to provide for his family who cared about his child so much that he was willing to go through all that to hopefully provide a better life for him and his child. 
And yeah, he took a lot of risks, but you need to take risks in life or else there's no big reward. Entrepreneurial risk is why they deserve the returns they get. You're saying, you're, so you're very much on board with the mother. The, hey, let's get, do something very practical here. Forget your dreams. Forget a, any kind of desire for happiness. Screw that. Forget it. And just get some job you hate. No, I think the mother was terrible too. In fact, she was probably worse. <laughs> No, listen, listen. You got the mother, right? All she does is bitch it at Will Smith. That's all she does. She works all these hours and has zero money, doesn't pay the rent, and then is more than willing to just give up her kid. That's she wasn't happy not, about it, but that's yeah. That's not mother of the year, man. Oh, I correct. I believe you. I agree. I thought that she, a lot of mothers... A lot of people that, you know, a lot of marriages that end in divorce feature, you know, people that just, quote, aren't happy. You know, I, I'm just not happy. And so she left. Well, I'm sorry, but like the movie says, life is about the pursuit of happiness, not necessarily the attainment of happiness. But, you know, she bailed. And, yeah, she left. I I. I didn't find any sympathy with her character. No, in fact, I, found, I, I, I thought that the exchange she was making of this fleeting happiness of maybe getting a job in New York at her cousin's boyfriend's restaurant at the, at the price of giving up her kid and her husband, how could that make you happier? It seems bizarre. It seems like her, her entire value scale is totally out of whack. Well, she chose it. That was her preference. So obviously there's, you know, you know, it's a movie. It's a, it's a reductive thing. It's not going to tell you the whole story. It's all told from his perspective. So maybe there's something we don't know that factored into her decision. I mean, maybe he didn't approve of her drug use and she wanted to get away from that. I don't know uh, where you're getting the drug use thing. I didn't see any of that. Are you kidding me? Watch- she looks strung out the whole movie. That's just what she looks like, man. Okay, she looks strung out, dude. I mean, did we watch the same movie? I feel like this is our Lion King discussion. Yeah, this is very much our Lion King discussion again, where yeah. I'm right and you're wrong. It's fine. It's not a big now, deal. You're, you're, you're filling in all these, all these made-up gaps. I mean, I, no, suppose, no, no. I suppose it would make sense that she cares more about the drugs than her family and that she's willing to go to New York, you know, to have her drug habit or something. Well, why, I, why does Will... Why does Will Smith tell her that she can't raise his, their son? Because she has no earning potential. She's a, a hotel uh, cleaning lady, and she's maybe going to get a job at a, as a waitress in a restaurant. Maybe. Okay. And you don't think that that's enough to raise a kid? I think that that was his point, that he was saying that she can't provide for the kid. Yeah, I think that's a stretch. Uh, that's that's possibly yeah, the part drug of it. thing's not a stretch. The drug thing is totally a stretch. The you can't make enough money to take care of the kid is essentially what he says in the movie. I don't think that he make that's the point he makes. I don't think that the point is that you can't financially support the kid. I think he's saying that you can't take care of the kid, and there's a difference there. That's financially is part of it, maybe, in the sense that, yeah, you also have all these other things you like to spend your money on. All right. I grant you that there's no scene, there's no overt scene where she's shooting smack or whatever. But it's a weird thing for him to say that you can't take care of our kid when it's just that, oh, because you're a, you work in a hotel or something. That's, that's ridiculous. Who would say that? 
Will Smith. There are plenty the of movie. hotel chambermaid people that have families. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they should have um, given her a bit more of a reason why. Because it's not yeah. clear in the movie. It's, you're right. It's not clear in the movie. Though there, there are clearly money problems within their relationship, and that, that, of course, leads to relationship problems. You're not kidding. It's one of the hugest reasons for divorce or right. issues in any kind of relationship. And every time that he interacts with her, like prior to the uh, separation, she is totally awful to him. Like, not supportive in any way. In the flashback where they buy these bone density scanners, she's super excited about it as well, right? They show her helping to offload them and put them into their apartment and take the picture together, and, like, she's all excited and ecstatic. So, I mean, it's clear to me that she was, like, good to go on this thing initially. But then I think she right. soured on, you know, when they weren't selling. And that's what this I don't... Is where you would be. <clears throat> well, yeah, but I, I would have been like, all right, well, let's, let's do something else that's actually going to bring in money in the meantime because this isn't working out. You know, we're not even paying our rent. Like, it's time to make some decisions here. Not just well, stiff started, our landlord. Well, he starts making money. When he starts selling them right before the IRS deals his money. He's like, he's got money in his bank account. He's feeling good. He's paying his rent. That's way, way down the path, man. He'd already been evicted. He's already living in the motel. His wife already left. Right. I'm talking about way upstream. You've got to start making some, some changes there. Now, what do you think their plan was with these bone density scanners? Because he did sell them all eventually, right? So mm -hmm. he had recouped his investment and then some because he didn't appear to be lowering the price. Like he was like, they're $250. They're $250, and that's what he's selling them for. Right. So he, he got all of his money back plus the profit. Um, do you think that his plan was that they were going to sell like hotcakes and that he would re-up and, and keep buying them and it would be a, like a viable business? You can only assume that that was what his plan was. But, yeah, I mean, when when he started relying on, you know, one sale a month to pay for groceries or whatever, then, yeah, I can imagine he changed his tune about the possibility of re-upping. Right, right. And then it was just a matter of, right, let's sell these out and, and do something else, and that's when this internship becomes something that, I mean, he, he, he wants to do the internship because he sees the guy park in front of the stock exchange or whatever uh, with a, is a Ferrari, right? He's like, I want to do whatever it is you do because you look super happy and super rich. <laughs> yeah, and everybody else, everybody walking out of the stock exchange building was looking happy, the stockbroker building or whatever, the Dean Witter building or whatever it was was just looking happy. And it might have been his, you know, perspective on things. I'm sure not everybody walking out of any one building is just all smiles all the time. But I mean, it, it was the, the 80s, right? So it was like everyone's like all coked out. And <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking, right? When I first saw that scene, I was like, everybody's high on cocaine. That's why everybody's looking happy. I mean, if you see The Wolf of Wall Street and then you watch this movie, you're like, oh, okay, that's what's going on. Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense now. Yeah. All right. So, so let's let's shift shift topic a little bit because we've been going quite a bit on my hate of this movie and, and your feeling for the guy. Let's let's focus our our let's give into our hate and focus on the government interfering with his pursuit of happiness. One, they continuously give him tickets for his parking. And then they eventually steal his car. And then, in a moment that I thought was related to his um, demanding that the kid be with him, uh, the cops show up at, it, at the apartment to take him away. 
And I thought, oh, well, this must be because the wife said, oh, he has my son and, you know, whatever. Because generally speaking, at least in today's environment, um, the law enforcement sides with the female in a uh, custody dispute, you know, probably, what, 90% of the time? I'm just throwing a number out there. You got to be a really messed up mom for the, the the court to not award you the kid. Absolutely, especially since the um, the state is the father and pays the pays for all the support. So a woman can just take the kids and get on welfare, and you're totally fine. You don't have to show that you can even financially support a kid. You just have to be not addicted to smack and work in the streets and whatever, and then you'll. All be right. The kid. So this and, is playing. Hey, not to paint too broad a brush, but that's generally what happens. Right, all right. So this is actually supporting your, your drug theory here. But no, the cops aren't there for that because they had just had the, the sun is coming with me thing. No, they're there for the parking tickets. They want that parking ticket money. And so they take him down to the station. Parking ticket money. Yeah, they take him down and he writes him a check. You know, this is all the money I have, but I'll settle up with you guys. And, you know, here's the check. I got to go get my son now. And they're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> you got to stay overnight. Because <laughs> uh, we got to make sure this check clears. That made me so mad. I cannot tell you. I mean, that's like lack of due process. That's lack of, you know, presumption of innocence. That's incarcerating someone. Uh, holding them against their will. I mean the litany of things that I want to hate on right now are ridiculous. And I'll uh, just pass it to you uh, for now. Well, if this was a completely private property situation and parking tickets were a completely voluntary thing, I mean, it is essentially voluntary, but it's the city government essentially claiming ownership over the parking you know, the sides of the streets and that sort of thing. So if it was just like, you know, the building owner and then they had a certain number of parking spots and then they charged, you know, I'd be, I'd be totally fine with that. That's fine. But I do take umbrage with a government just declaring that they own this, these spaces. Um, and you could argue that, yeah, they make the roads, but we could get go down that whole rabbit trail. I don't need to <laughs> necessarily crack open that can of worms. But, um, yeah, so they declare that they own these spots and that, you know, you're – but to go with your argument of, hey, you need to pay off the – you know, it's stupid not to pay these overlords off to not harass you. Wasn't it – I mean, he's not – you you didn't give him a pass for the taxes, but now you're upset about the parking tickets. It seems like the same kind of deal. If he had just paid these, I mean, at one point he um, he's parking a car for his boss, and he he goes to put money in the in the uh, thingamajig, in the meter, and he and he digs around in his pocket, he can't find any coins, and then he just takes off instead of paying it because he had to make a, a meeting for you know to make essentially what turns out to be the thing that saves him. Um, the the football game and that that contact that gets him all the the business from all those people that eventually earns him his spot. But I'm I'm curious. I mean I'm I'm upset about the kidnapping as well. The the fact that these people would you know just right kidnap him and hold him overnight when he has to go get his kid and whatever. Of course it's it's all false imprisonment kidnapping that sort of thing. But to go with your argument against taxes. Wasn't it stupid not to, you know, pay the the meters and all that stuff? And I don't I don't have any knowledge about how terrible it is parking in downtown San Francisco. I can imagine it's terrible. Uh, parking if it's anything like parking in downtown Seattle, it's a nightmare. So, but anyway, Daniel, uh, your to your to your point there. Yeah, it was it was stupid of him to not have paid these off initially as additional protection money, though I, I, I'm, I think it was probably, I mean, not paying your parking tickets is kind of in the, in my cultural memory, like as a normal 
thing referred to in television shows and movies like, oh, you know, no one pays parking tickets or something. Um, but I think that he should have been, you know, taking care of, of these things that could affect him when he had the chance to do it. And that doesn't excuse the fact that once he did pay it, that they then imprison him because, you know, it needs to clear the next day. And, and it's, I, I, I kind of understand because, you know, checks bounce and, and all this, but, you know, then just go get him again or whatever. Right. But, you know, don't, like, totally screw this guy up. Uh, I mean, he's he's got his kid he's got to deal with. I don't know. It it seemed... All right, so I think he could have avoided it, but they went way too far in the situation. Fair enough. I mean, I don't count on the government doing anything properly or morally, so... I would agree with that. Um, do you have any issues with the entire, I don't know, the claiming of, the one of the points that he made in the beginning when he shows like his car getting towed and all the tickets on it, he's like, didn't he say something about always being in a hurry in order to sell these things or something like that? Because he always parks in like, hospitals because he's always selling to hospitals. I don't know. I feel like there's something we could say about that, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, don't, says, I don't know what it's like to, to park in San Francisco, but I imagine it's terrible. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I imagine that it's one of those deals where if you need parking, it's hard to find. <laughs> um I mean, especially around hospitals. I mean, I used to live near a hospital in Seattle, and, and parking was pretty tough around there. But I, I think that he just was struggling to sell these things, and so he was just trying to make more and more appointments to try to try to make these sales, and he wasn't able to. Uh, plan uh, accordingly to be able to ensure that he had an opportunity to get parking. Yeah, it is a lot of conjecture and whatnot we have to go through here because we're not given the whole story, of course, and we only have his perspective. I don't know. I, if I was a hospital owner, I mean, I would want, you know, spots available for emergency situations. I don't know if that's the case. You want certain spots available for visitors, you want spots available for staff. Uh, you know, and if if a car is parked improperly, I you have every right to, you know, move it and get it towed. Um I I I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for him on that situation. Like you said, um you know, he's struggling to sell these things, maybe he could have been doing a better job. I don't know. It's we don't have the whole story here. Yeah, and and one last note on you know deciding to sell these these things. Uh, he has to lug this probably heavy device. <laughs> it's very cumbersome around with him all the time, and I I I, I got to imagine that that would be enough to tell him to not do this anymore. You know. No way, man! You got those guns. It's looking good. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is right after Ali, right? He did the Ali movie. Oh, this is a, five years later. But anyway, I don't know. let's get into the tears jerk because it sounds like there's a lot of tears jerk for you. There, there was a moment that really hit me, and that was that he grew up fatherless, and so he wanted to make a point to do the exact opposite of how he was raised, and he wanted to be there for his kid, and that hit me in the feels a bit. And then also there was a moment that um, somebody had made a comment on Facebook about very touching moments in movies just in general and this movie was brought up and they said that it was very uh, emotional elicit, elicitation of tears when he was pretending that they were traveling in time and seeing dinosaurs and then they went into the men's room in the BART station and uh, went to sleep as like a camp out 
and he's like sitting there crying while someone's trying to get into the bathroom. So a fair fair number of tears jerked on that. Uh, how about for you? Uh, yeah, the scene you just, just described was fairly strong for me. Uh, quite a number of tears. Um, and then there's a, a later scene, which if you're a child of divorce, um, it's, it's kind of an easy get. Like any time a kid asks a parent, you know, why did mom leave or, you know, why did so-and-so, was I not good enough? That, you know, that, that hits me right in the feels because that's something that happened to me personally as a kid. And having those feelings of, you know, why did, did someone not love me enough? You know, was I not good enough? That, that hits me really hard. Um, and then at the very end, when he's gone through this whole trials and tribulations and just, you know, struggled, tried so hard, when um, the boss guy says, you know, wear a shirt tomorrow, that was good. And Will Smith starts tearing up right there in the movie, and so did I. And So, yeah, this was a strong emotional movie for me. Um, I mean, I suppose it would be less so if you just hated these characters and thought that they were stupid and making dumb mistakes. But uh, I felt more sympathy for these characters. And, uh, yeah, as a matter of course, I felt more emotion when they uh, succeeded or failed or whatever they were feeling. So... I thought it was a well-written movie. All right, so how, how many tears jerked for, from you, sir? Oh, this is a strong emotional... I would say this is end up in the 7, 7.5 range uh, from 1 to 10. Um, there are movies where I'm just a blubbering mess, and this isn't quite one of them. But for those emotional scenes, there are you know, is a pretty strong strong reaction for me. Okay. It was hit or miss for me. I'm going to go with maybe a five in the middle because there were the moments that we discussed and the few that, that you just brought up that were certainly emotional, but yeah, just my disdain for the endless calamity of the consequences of his poor decisions uh, made the movie just drag on for me and, and seem extremely long. Uh, and speaking of extremely long, that's what she said. Uh, we're almost to an hour already, so we need to start winding this thing down. But there were some other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, one was the um, the attempt to go to the women's shelter when he first gets evicted from the hotel. And he gets discriminated against because it's for women and children. And that's where yeah. he learned about the men's shelter. But I thought that was kind of interesting. Certainly. You want to talk about that's that for a wrong... moment? Uh, yeah, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, and I, I, I did a quick search looking for some numbers, but I couldn't find any. I know that they're out there. If you watch any number of um, MRA-type videos, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about you know, the discrepancy between women's shelters to men's shelters. And if this movie is any indication, uh, there was no long line outside of the women's shelter, the women and children's shelter. And it's probably due to the fact that there are – I forget what it is, but it's something like – 20 to 1 or 30 to 1 or I don't know, but it's, it's a massive discrepancy towards women and children. And, you know, it's probably due to the, um, the majority view from the people that fund those things. I imagine it's not all public funds. I imagine a fair amount of it is like private charities that fund those things. And they see, you know, women and children being more vulnerable um, and as a matter of that, you know, the, the majority of homeless are men. It's something like 90, 94% or something like that, 95% is men, male homeless. And, yeah, it's a massive long line for the one male shelter in town. And, yeah, he had to get there at a certain time in order to try and get in because, you know, they can only take so many. But, yeah, they um, – and I have no problem with the discrimination. You know, if you are a private – donor and you want to say, hey, I, this money only goes towards women and children. You only let in women and children. That's your business. That's fine. Um, if it's public funds, though, however, that's, that's a more interesting topic where 
you know, they're going to just openly discriminate against men who are obviously in need of shelter. And then they're just like, well, no, hit the bricks, buddy. You're a dude. You have a penis, so get out of here because clearly you can fend for yourself because we offer so many things for men and not for women. But, you know, um, I, we don't know. In this movie, you're not given all that backstory and information. So all I can really say is just the the obvious um, lack of support for men in this movie and in reality for male homeless people. Um, not that it's any one particular person's fault. I mean, if, it's, if you're a private donor, like I said, and you want to only, you know, support women and children, that's your business, and i got no problem with that. But if, you know, you're a government and you claim to care about your citizens and you're all about equality, but yet you only support the women and children of the, your citizens, well, <laughs> I, would, I would question why that is. Yeah, it seems a little hypocritical, but... That is also par for the course when it comes to uh, how governments tend to operate. You know, the bill has a nice and shiny name about what its intended purpose is, and then the results are, generally speaking, the exact opposite. And uh, the means of funding are, are, of course, immoral and all the rest. Uh, a lot of unintended consequences and uh, moral hazard and incentives and seen and unseen issues going on there. But we do need to start winding this one down. I do want to, um, before we get into our final summary and review, bring up one last issue, and, and it was another mistake that Will had made, uh, is that he got into a fight with his friend over the $14 and burned that bridge. And so then when he was evicted from his motel, he had nowhere to go. And I thought that that was kind of an interesting thing because had he not insisted on the $14, then he probably would have had a place to stay that night. Yeah, I mean, we could argue that he was a, an asshole and that he hadn't developed the interpersonal relationship support network that most people develop by the time they're his age where they can, you know, you can go to them for help. I mean, we didn't see Will Smith's mother in this movie. I mean, apparently he met his father when he was 28, I think he said. Um, but apparently he has, you know, parents that he could have sought help from or relatives of any kind, brothers, sisters. I mean, all we're giving is this one guy who owes him $14, which is kind of strange. I mean, he did say that he was from what? He grew up in, like, Alabama or something like that or Arkansas or Louisiana? Yeah, something like that. And yeah. Moved, yeah, and then he moved out to... San Francisco, I guess, with the Navy, I assume, because he said he was in the Navy. Uh, maybe he had some Navy, Navy buddies? I don't know. But, yeah, it's weird that he wouldn't have any kind of really support group structure at this point, that they don't really have any friends that they could rely on, even for, like, a couch to crash on or something. Um, I didn't. I never thought that he had made a mistake with that $14 guy. Um, but... Now that you bring that up, yeah, maybe he – I mean, maybe he did – in real life, maybe he did have those those supports, but he was just, just too proud, and he didn't want to, you know, rely on those kind of things. I don't know. You also don't see him applying for welfare or anything like that. Yeah, I do applaud that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good thing. Um, and the $14 thing, I mean, it's similar with, with the wife, right? Like money problems create relationship problems. And so $14, you know, even back in the 80s when it was actually worth something, um, probably not a huge deal until you really need every dollar, right? Like when um, the head of the firm was like, oh, do you have $5 for this cab ride? I, I don't have time to go grab my wallet. And he's like, uh, here you go, even though he can't afford it. Right. Um, but, you know, when, you, when you're down to the dregs, you know, down to the, the moths that are flying out of your wallet, um, I guess that $14 was more than $14, right, to him? Like on his marginal sure. utility, like that was all the money he had claimed to. 
and this guy was like not giving it to him, which, you know, kind of a dick thing. But he, he also then burnt that bridge as a result. And that ended up costing him a potential place to stay. Hard to know that, you know, of course, but but anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's get into the final summary and review. I'll let you go first, and then we will end this show of The Last Nighters. It can be found at lastnighters.com slash 10 show notes and more. Well, as you can tell from the episode, I really like this movie. Um, I think it has a strong emotional core. Um, it doesn't really have a an arc for the main character so much. Like, he makes, you know, just your basic trials and tribulation type mistakes. Um and he, he sort of learns from them, sort of not. He's taking a big risk to, you know, hopefully pay off. Maybe it's not the smartest thing in the world. But, I, you know, he's a human being. And we all do dumb things. And maybe we're, you know, don't have the, the smartest tact. I can definitely identify with him on that. I'm going for, you know, a very kind of lucrative, you know, uh, high-risk low chance of paying off type thing as well. Um, so I identify on that level. Uh, it's not your typical, you know, like I said, uh, character with an arc. It's more of uh, just a struggle for that character. So the movie is banking on you identifying with the character and their tri- their troubles in order to establish likability and emotional connection and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it had a good message. You know, uh, do what it takes to achieve your dream. Uh, the, if, what is life if not the pursuit of happiness? So for me, this is a strong eight, despite its, you know, uh, maybe some of the more questionable decisions that the characters make. But if the, if the characters just go through and make all perfect decisions, there's no movie. You need characters to make mistakes in order for there to be any interesting thing happen ever. So... Nobody's interested to watch a movie about perfect people doing perfect things perfectly. So, good movie. Check it out. All right. Well, I kind of went into it sort of thinking that, oh, this might be a little bit like Founder, you know, like entrepreneurial and some lessons to take from it. And in a way, it was, but not in the uh, way I, I had thought in remembering this movie before watching it again. Um, I did get a lot of takeaways, and that is mostly in things to not do uh, and things to avoid. The bone density scanners, I think, was, you know, I applaud him for taking that entrepreneurial risk and getting excited about something, but he apparently didn't do his due diligence and see if there was a market for these things. He didn't adjust to that market. He didn't uh, take any steps to... Uh, make sure that he was covering his his obligations in the meantime, rent, the parking tickets he was getting, the IRS extortion that he was being demanded to be paid. And so those were some uh, mistakes that he he had his value scale kind of like thrown off, right? He wasn't taking care of the most important stuff. He was focusing, I think, in my opinion, uh, too much on this, big payoff that wasn't really going to come. Like the bone density scanner thing just was not working out. And it's, you know, the market is fickle, right? You have to satisfy the desires of consumers. And uh, he took an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial risk and he failed. Uh, Even though he ended up selling them all, it took him way too long and he ate through all of his um, whatever profits he had made just in whatever expenses he was actually paying when he wasn't stealing cab rides or stealing rent or stealing uh, hotel rate fees or lying about why he's in certain neighborhoods. I mean, he just goes on and on doing like just terrible things uh, throughout this whole movie. And it's just calamity after calamity, though. He does have that dream, right? That vision that once he discovers what uh, he wants to do, he does go after it and he doesn't let anything get in the way, even taking care of his kid, making sure that there's a roof over his head. So I don't know. Maybe there's some like problems with this guy. Um, he, he does clearly care for his son in the emotional sense, but not in the, uh, you know, 
physical needs kind of way, like food, shelter, etc. So I, I had a lot of problems with this movie. I'm going to give it like a three, three and a half. Um, not, not one of my favorite movies. So that's where I'm going to leave it. And Robert and I disagree big time on this one. Will Smith believed in himself, and he chased his dream believing in himself when no one else would. And I think that's a important lesson to be learned. Um, Daniel did not believe in Will Smith or his, his abilities. Yeah, he was just and he was spinning enough. his wheels with that thing, and he needed to cut his losses. But I do agree with the final message, and that is if you see something that you want, you go and work your ass off, and, and you go and achieve it. And so that is a positive lesson I can take out of this, the Pursuit of Happiness, uh, the 10th episode of The Last Nighters, and you can find this at lastnighters.com slash 10. Uh, any final words before we play our outro music, Robert? Uh, no. Thanks for listening, everybody. It's been an honor and a privilege. You are some very attractive, good-looking people from where I sit. Um have a sexy, sexy evening. All right, everyone, and uh, good night from last night. Here we are, lastnighters.com slash 10. And continuing the transmission on the Actual Anarchy podcast for a few more, few more minutes. Uh, what was a rather contentious episode of The Last Nighters, and this is actualanarchy.com slash 67 show notes for this page. Robert and I disagreed heavily on this movie, um, but I think we're going to get into it even more on a future episode of Boys Night Out, our new show where we have guests and we talk about movies and whatever organic conversation offshoots from there. And we're trying to land uh, Mr. Anthony Samaroff to talk about housing and homelessness and all the programs and rent controls and other things that get in the way and exacerbate problems. Um, at least I think that's uh, what we have in mind, right, Robert? Yeah, Anthony knows a fair bit about regulations and housing issues and problems that government creates. I mean, the housing market is messed up in so many ways through artificial scarcity, through guaranteed home loans. I mean, all kinds of ways government gets in there and just messes with all kinds of different things, um, from what kind of toilets you can and can't have to the whether or not somebody declares your property you know, safe and sound and secure or not. Um, they just... They find ways to be the experts on all kinds of things when they can't possibly be, nor do they have the moral right to be. So, yeah, hopefully we'll get into that with uh, Anthony. And it just causes it causes homelessness, absolutely. I mean, between, between minimum wages and all kinds of different regulations, I mean, imagine the number of homes that the market could bring to people if there weren't a million and one regulations between building, between um, approval of architecture plans and how long that process takes, it takes like up to a year in places, to all the different um, regulators that have to sign off from environmental concerns to safety and you know materials and all kinds of different things you wouldn't even think of. But it's all in the name of safety. And every time, like, a building collapses, they call it a failure of, like, capitalism. And they never talk about homelessness as a failure of government. And it's really hypocritical and stupid. Yeah, I think that would be a a very interesting and potentially long conversation. Um, He is from Scotland, and I know from watching a lot of um, home and renovation shows with my wife, that uh, many of them are based in the UK, and they always talk about getting permission from the planning commission on new builds or even renovations, and it sounds like there are a lot of stringent 
rules and regulations and things that need to be followed to even get approval to construct something on your own property. So, I mean, yep. if you think it's bad in the U.S., it sounds like it's uh, much, much worse elsewhere. Um, and it's bad enough here, I think. But I digress. Between zoning laws and, yeah, whether you can build something on your property if it has a fixed roof or not. I mean, on the property I'm on right now, I've got a, a barn. It doesn't have a fixed roof, so we were able to avoid that regulation. And, you know, that's just a market solution to, you know, overburdening stupid regulation. But, you know, I would have probably been nice to have a fixed roof, but then you have to pay, you know, and have it inspected and have it be up to code and all sorts of regulatory bullshit. Yeah, it's funny. There's always this, like, arms race between technology and regulation and innovation. And, you know, government's always behind... Uh, in the race on technologies, new emerging technologies, and then the, when they finally catch up, it's too little, too late, or overbearing, and then people work towards um, getting around those regulations, like either through gr grandfathering or um, taking the literal, you know, wording of the law. Like one example is when shower heads uh, were deemed to only do a certain gallons per minute output. Uh, you know, these low flow shower heads to quote unquote save water. Um, there was this innovative company that said, oh, okay, well it says, you know, eight gallons per minute uh, per shower head, uh, making the numbers up. But whatever the number was, they just said, oh, well we'll just make an, a fixture that has like three shower heads and then it doesn't apply to us. So we'll just do whatever we want with two or three shower heads. And so they, they were able to skirt around that law for uh, for a number of years and then of course, government caught up to them and ended up preventing them from selling those types of uh, hot units or those illegal, illicit units of multi-head shower shower heads. Crazy ridiculous. Yeah. Those, those horrible people that are trying to improve their customers' lives. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Monsters. Right. And my wife and I, we went to um, Iceland a couple of years ago, and they have geothermal energy there and the hot water it's hot in the ground right so the shower you turn those on it's like a freaking jet man it's like you know it's crazy uh, it's like you're you're gonna tear your skin off in those showers there because they have you know an endless supply it's it's a post-scarcity world of hot water there what a dream sounds like a dream yeah, if you if you enjoy hot showers, that's where you got to go. Go to Iceland. And uh, you're in taking a hot shower, man. You want that, you want that pressure. You want that water pressure. That's Nobody right. likes a limp shower. I'm sorry. You got to get clean, man. Got to get clean. Well, speaking of getting clean, let's uh, let's wind this one down. It's been over an hour already. Uh, a little, uh, more more than more than an hour. And we might do a little bit of Kathleen Turner overdrive. And you can get uh, in on that action by supporting us on Patreon, uh, actualanarchy.com slash Patreon, readrothbard.com slash Patreon, or patreon.com slash readrothbard. Any of the three will get you to the same place, and we will continue the discussion there uh, on this episode of the Actual Anarchy Podcast. And the show notes can be found at slash 67. So I'm going to say good night and give Robert the final word, and then we will uh, continue on in the Kathleen Turner Overdrive. You take care of your sexy selves, everybody. Make sure you got a, a roof over your head before you go pursuing your dreams. <laughs> <laughs>